Well, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this for the uh, Gain School of Business for the Entrepreneurship uh, Seminar. And uh, we are very uh, privileged to have um, our speaker, uh, Dr. Robert Gould, and uh, an alum of Spring Island University in the uh, class of 1976, almost four decades ago. But what, uh, Dr. Gould is full of energy, and uh, he has been to different events already. He spoke in my class at a good time, went to chapel, down here to speak to the, this audience, and then right after, we could uh, have uh, Doug Gold uh, be the uh, speaker at the, the webcast, too, as part of the, the Game Studio Business for the Leadership uh, Webinar. And then he'll go to lunch and meet the people, and then another the engagement with the, with the science students in the afternoon. But uh, Dr. Gould is here uh, as a speaker. In, uh, how many of you have uh, read this article on the journal? No one. You should pick up a copy around campus. This is the Spring Art University Journal. And uh, there is an article about Dr. Gould. And uh, I'm not going to read everything to you. And, uh, but I want to highlight a few things. And also let you know that what the form is going to be for today, our uh, time together. And uh, we have until the like at 11.50, about half an hour, so I'm going to ask for that Dr. Gold to come and speak briefly, maybe 10, 15 minutes, and uh, the topic, which is building company, the story of a biotech company, and uh, Dr. Gould uh, currently is president and CEO of the company, a biotech company uh, based off of uh, Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. And my understanding is what the company is about, not too far from the, the campus of MIT, the Development Business. And uh, today, uh, the company is worth as an asset of uh, uh, $894 million and, uh, per uh, NASDAQ, uh, is the uh, market cap. And those who are in the campaign of finance, you know what market cap is all about. And, uh, we are uh, so glad that the Dr. Gold uh, uh, is here with us and I'm going to be studying it on this and uh, we want to learn as much as we can from Dr. Gold and we'll open up for some Q&A time and uh, some of you have uh, pick up a, uh, an index card so that I'm going to collect your questions if you have any. We also the, hope that there will be time for us to do some uh, Q&A at the end and just raise your hand and uh, we'll have time to make it happen. And also the, in light of the fact about this and other events coming up at noon, right here, the admissions as an event, we won't give you too long. So then, without further ado, and let's welcome Dr. Gould. Thanks, Caleb. So, uh, as Caleb said, what I'll do is I'll just talk for a few minutes, maybe 10 minutes, and then we can go uh, to the next phase of the program. So let me give you a little uh, history about Epicyne and how I ended up uh, running the company. Uh, because when I was at Spring Arbor, I never imagined that I would be an entrepreneur and never imagined I'd be running a company. And now that I'm doing that, I can't imagine why I didn't do it earlier, 20 or 30 years ago, as opposed to you know, now. So Epizyme is a six-year-old company. We got started in March of 2008 uh, with a $14 million Series A investment from, from venture capital uh, firms. So in the biotech world, uh, most biotech companies start with an investment from, from venture funds. They typically partner together to share their risk across that early investment. In that regard, Epizyme is no different than any other uh, venture-backed biotechnology company. The two biotechnology companies that started us uh, were on the East Coast and the West Coast. Um, the East Coast company was a company called MPM Capital. The West Coast company was a company called Kleiner Perkins. Kleiner Perkins is perhaps best known for its seed investment that it made in a company that you may have heard of called Google. Um, and the seed investment they made in a biotech company many years ago called Genentech. And, uh, Gen those two companies alone um, have more than paid for Kleiner's original investment in them. In, uh, uh, so Kleiner on the West Coast, MPM on the East Coast, were the two venture capitals that, that put approximately seven million each in uh, to get Epizyme started. And I actually joined the board at that time as an independent board member. 
Kleiner being on the West Coast wanted a local representative that was independent from MPM to help oversee the, the company, and I had retired from my prior career at that point, and so ha was happy to do it. I, my prior career, I'd spent uh, 23 years at a large pharmaceutical company called Merck, uh, had uh, run drug discovery there for a number of years, uh, decided that two things happened. One is I qualified for early retirement at a point in time when I couldn't wait to uh, try something else in my life. Big companies are fun to get started in. Um, they're fun to be in for a while, and then for me at least, there came a point where it was no longer fun, and I was so happy to go out and, and try my hand at something else. And that something else was Epizon. Um, that 14 million uh, that we started the company with lasted us um, until about December of 09, 2009, at which point uh, we did a series of B financing of about 40 million. So a 54 million venture uh, funding uh, got the company started. Drug discovery, which is what Epizon does, it's an expensive proposition. You have a, typical, a typical drug, by the time you, you, you count all the, all the costs um, in, which includes failures, not the direct costs, but also the indirect costs of failures, um, depending on the analyses and depending on the company, these, these days costs between one and 10 billion to the B dollars to get a, a product to market. That variation depends on how many failures you have in other programs along the way, which of course as a pharmaceutical company, you still have to pay for. And so all those, the direct costs of, of the drugs that work um, is about 200 million or so. Um, but by the time you factor in all the failures, that, can, that becomes somewhere between one and 10 billion. Often say you know, major league players that can hit 300, you know, demand pretty good salaries. If you're right in drug discovery one out of three times, um, that's astonishing. It's hardly ever been done in, in the history of the pharmaceutical industry. Just to give you some idea of the odds that that are uh, that we're fighting against. So, looking at that, even if even if Epizon was successful, we're looking at you know, let's call it. Two ish hundred million, uh, if we're successful, and somewhere towards a billion uh, in order to make a viable product. The question arises how long can you keep doing that? So, uh, there's only so much private money one can raise in the world, even from venture capital. And having raised 54 million, what we faced as a company was a strategic plan of how were we going to grow the company? How were we going to enable ourselves to generate the capital um, that in pretty considerable capital to drive the company um, towards a successful product. And what we decided to do about a year, about coming up on about two years ago now, was um, we decided to uh, become a public company. We decided to do an initial public offering or an IPO, which we uh, did last June, uh, which we closed on last June, June 13. And that, for us, was an, un that was an unusual choice in a, couple, in a couple of different ways. The first was that we were still what's called a preclinical company. So we, our products were, were not yet in clinical testing. In fact, we didn't know if they were going to work in humans or not. And so to become a public company at that level of development, um, it, and where the financial markets were two years ago, was a little bit unusual. Uh, you usually need, because of a high failure rate, you need clinical data before anybody will invest in a public company. Nonetheless, we felt that we had a compelling story. And that's, and that's sort of the first thing, piece of advice I'd give to you if you want to be an entrepreneur, be sure you've got a great, compelling story that you can tell over and over again. And a portion of telling that story, so my, my parents were missionaries, so I grew up listening to more sermons than you can imagine. There's always three points in the sermon, in case you guys haven't noticed, it's always three. So my three points today are, uh, just to tell you, are uh, uh, passion, uh, people, and paranoia. So um, the first thing is, is the first reason we decided to become a public company is we were that passionate about our story. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, you need to be passionate about your story. And that passion needs to be expressed and lived out daily. So that, that, that was the first thing that was unusual. The second thing that was unusual is in the world that I live in, uh, the high-tech world, the biotech world, 
IPOs have not been a, a, an exit uh, for venture firms in um, approaching a decade now. So the venture firms invest in a company like us, invested the 54 million with the full expectation that we're going to get a significant return. So a significant return without accounting for time, just in terms without accounting for time, um, sort of the time cost of dollars, just the absolute return for them is, is a good a, a return they're happy with is a 3x return. Um, a 10 plus x return makes them ecstatic. Um, in our, in the biotech world, it's typically 10-year funds that they're investing out of, so they get money from limited partners, they set up a, a, a fund, and then it's a, a fund with a 10-year life. So what they're looking at in that is about 10% of their companies, on average, to give them about a 10x return. Uh, uh, so one out of 10 companies to give them a 10x. Um, five to seven companies to give them a 3x and the rest are not going to give them any return at all. And that's kind of a rough formula that they go by. Um, so with a 54 million in a company like us, they would need uh, somewhere between 154 million to a 500 million dollar exit within the lifetime of their fund in order, in order to make, make their money. Um, if you look on the other side, I'm not a venture fund. I have none of my own money invested in the company, and I had a um, significant amount of time, energy, passion, belief invested in the company, as did the other people. So there's the other side of the equation, which is, um, what the, as an employee, what do I get from the company if we sell the company rather than do an IPO? So the venture fund funds would be happy with 154, uh, let's call it 150 on up exit. When you look at the way venture, our venture funds were set up, there was something in the original uh, construct of the company in which there was a 3x preferential preferred uh, clause. So for those of you that are in the business side of the world, a 3x preferential preferred from the venture uh, um, world, and the way these, these terms were written, meant that of their 54 million, they get 3x back before anybody else gets anything. So they get 154 million before anybody else that's in the company, like the employees, get anything as we go as we sell the company. So that sets a basement, if you will. The second part of that is they own about 80% of the company. So they'll get 154 million. They own 80% of the company. They, when it's private, when it sells, they then get 80% of everything that comes after that 154 million because they own 80% of the company. So the way the contract was written, they get 154, then let's just make, make it easy, let's imagine uh, that we got 200 million, so another 146 million. They would get 80% of that 46, so they would get, oh, it's not 40, just to make the number easy. Um, and then the other six million of the two hundred million dollar sale now gets split between a company that at that time was about fifty employees. So now a number of those employees have been working for four to five years. And in a venture-backed biotech company, it's the equity in the com company that is really you're hoping to uh, succeed. At. So for us, that as employees, that means that we we had a, a basement of about uh, two hundred sixty-seven. About 267 million um, that would be the only thing that we'd accept selling our company for. So as we work through those equations, preclinical company, 267 million, where the markets were, we made the strategic decision to go and become a public company, um, even though we were preclinical. And the reason we felt we could do that is the key of the passion. We had a great story that we could tell, we believed strongly in that, and we had people who believed strongly in that, which is the, the uh, second thing. Um, we did our IPO last, um, as I said, June of 13. We did a, a somewhat unusual thing there, too. When you, when you do an, I, uh, um, an IPO, you typically do what's called a roadshow. So a roadshow can be anywhere from a week to two weeks in which you uh, fly around the country meeting with prospective investors, telling their story. On um, any given day, uh, your day will be would start with uh, 6 a.m. phone calls to investors in Europe because of the time difference. 
and you usually finish with either calls or visits to uh, invest, uh, investors on the West Coast. So your day will start at 6 and finish at about 10. And you'll do that every day for maybe two weeks. And you'll do it in major cities. So we did it in, uh, uh, started in New York, did a couple of days in New York, uh, a day in Baltimore. Uh, I'm sorry, a day in Philadelphia, a day in Baltimore, another couple of days in New York, two days in Boston, a day in Chicago, a day in Denver, a day in Los Angeles, two days in San Francisco, and then finished up with another half day in Chicago. Um, and you're doing 12 to 14 hour days. Um, so it's really exhausting to do this virtual. And you have to do it to get the investors. The other unusual thing that we did is we decided to split our, our roadshow up over the morning day, which, which is typically not done because of the break in the middle. We want continuity, we want people to be excited about your store, buy in your company, and, and um, get everything that you're asking for. Um, because of our, our, our commitment, because of the work we've done ahead of time, and that's where the paranoia part comes in, we were convinced that we would never be able to pull this off. And so we were so paranoid that we weren't going to be able to pull this off that we had done probably um, almost eight months of pre-work before we ever started on our road show. So we'd met with all of our potential investors three or four times before we finally asked them to buy into the company, just telling them our story, showing the progress we were making, uh, because we were completely paranoid that, that this, this wouldn't happen and it would be a dismal failure. The board would hate us, the investors would hate us, you know, we, we ended our lives uh, as we knew it. Um, and, and that's where the paranoia part uh, actually helped us. To cut a long story short, we were offering, uh, I'll make a long story longer, whatever's happening here, we, had, uh, we were uh, hoping to raise uh, 54 million in that initial public offering. We ended up raising 80, and we had enough sales booked that um, all of our 54 million allocation shares were sold by noon on the first day. Um, five days, working days later, uh, we could have sold almost 12x what we had asked for in terms of shares. So we bumped our share price up, we held it at, at um, we bumped our share price up, which is SEC regulation on how many share, additional shares you can offer. Um, we offered all of that tail that we could offer under SEC regulation rate, so we ended up raising 80 million. Then, um, in order to keep funding the company, because if you're adding up, you see we're only at 134 million, which is only enough to get one product moving forward. Um, in order to keep funding the company, we did a follow-on uh, offering in in March of this year, we raised another 100 million. So we'll finish this year with about 170 million. Um, in, in uh, more than 107 million in uh, uh, cash or receivables. Uh, and that's enough to fund us, for me, the most important thing. That's enough to, for us to fund us into five uh, clinical trials in which we can test our products actually in patients and now six years later see if we actually have something that works. And that's the point of raising the money. And that's the point of telling the business aspect of why we wanted to raise that much money. It was in order to fund the clinical trials. So I'm going to stop there and ask if there's any questions that people have on uh, you know, sort of that fundraising part of why we wanted to raise that money and how we raised it. Well, thank you, Dr. Cole. And then uh, we have the microphone that we can pass around so you can just ask questions if you want to just uh, give me in this course. Uh, I can also take that. Why don't we start with uh, a couple of questions? <laughs> Well, best is always a question. <laughs> right. uh, let's use the microphone. Okay. One question I would have is, how long do you expect to be before you actually have, I, I just ordered the market, three years, five years, or what? Before, so before you actually are able to take things to market. Yeah. So, I'm going to use this moment, so I'm not out of constant time. Is that working? This one? Yep. So uh, a typical drug discovery cycle takes about 10 years from when you initiate a program until you have uh, uh, a product that you can sell. And if you look at that distribution of 10 years, there's about two or three years that are in um, what's called uh, preclinical or basic research testing. There's about two or three years, there's about a year basically that's in what's called preclinical testing where you assess uh, things like uh, is the drug safe in animals? Can you manufacture the kilo quantities of it? Kilo, you know, 
we always talk in, in uh, kilo units, um, uh, kilogram units or hundreds of kilograms that, that are necessary for the clinical trials. And then, then usually about five to seven years of uh, clinical testing, followed by about a year of regulatory approval. Drug discovery and drug identification is perhaps the most highly regulated industry that there is in this country uh, or around the world. There, there are uh, uh, five basic stages in drug discovery, and four of those stages require regulatory oversight and approval. So there's a lot of, of there's about a year of that regulatory review. So that's your average life cycle, about 10 years. So if you imagine uh, uh, Epizyme, um, or a six-year-old company, so just by statistics, it'd be a, a, at least another four years before we were to get there. We have a slightly different approach, which is that we were in a, a cancer drug discovery company. Cancer is fundamentally a change in the underlying uh, DNA sequence of certain cells, and so we can target our products um, even in the testing phase, directly into cancer patients that have the genetic alteration that's driving their cancer, which gives us a, 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 a tremendous speed advantage. So we have two programs that are currently in the clinic. Um, uh, they been, they were in the clinic about uh, two years ago. Um, and that was part of the story that we were able to tell people with great passion, is that we can tell almost immediately that we go into humans whether the drug works or not. So we don't have to wait three or four years it's typical, and in fact, in both our clinical trials, we've seen um, early evidence that our drug's actually working, in one case in the leukemia population, in another case in the lymphoma, non-Hodgkin lymphoma population. So that may help cut some of the time out. It's a, it's a long process. Other questions? Um, at the beginning, you were talking about how you didn't see yourself being an entrepreneur. Um, what made you think that at the beginning? So I, um, I have to go all the way back to my early childhood. I was born at a very young. Um, <laughs> the, um, I had decided when I was probably in the 10th or 11th grade that I was going to be a chemistry major. Um, and. Um, or a science major, at least. I, I briefly flirted with being a math major and realized that, that there are two kinds of math majors. There's the half a percent that are just brilliant people, and there's the other 99.5% of people. And I clearly fit in the 99.5% category. So I switched from math to, to uh, chemistry, thinking I would go to uh, medical school. Um, decided that if you go to medical school and become a physician, you have to like touch sick people and that, that wasn't what I wanted to do. So I went and got a PhD in biochemistry, really to do drug discovery. And I imagined I would work at a big pharmaceutical company doing drug discovery. And a little bit of my logic was, um, I'm joking aside from the sick people, was if I discovered a drug that was effective and saved people's lives, I could impact thousands and thousands of people versus as a, as a physician, I might be able to directly impact tens or hundreds. And, and for me, from just sort of a leveraging point of view of what I want to do with my life, I wanted to do drug discovery because I like chemistry. You know, it's part of, uh, for me, it was part of the process of understanding how I took my talents and interests that I had and used them for what it says in Ephesians, which is God's created good things for us to do since before we even knew him. And it's our job to find those good things and do them. And for me, that's was drug discovery. Um, so I, I was doing drug discovery, and I realized that while I could do that um, at a big company, I was, and I was fortunate enough to be involved with, with uh, uh, 23 years I was there, uh, me or teams I ran um, were lucky enough to get six market products. So I, I was fortunate in that regard. And I realized that I really had a passion for drug discovery and for really building new things. And I didn't realize that when I went to the big company. I was also fortunate enough that I always imagined I would leave after a few years, and every two or three years I got a new role in the company, so it always felt like new jobs. When I got a chance to retire, I realized I liked doing new things. And that's, that revelation came when I was 50 or something like that. 
Um, so it took me a while to realize how much I like new, doing new things, and that's why I ended up starting and running Epizone, because it satisfied that passion and my passion in drugs. And so within the next 10 years, where do you uh, see this coming from? So um, uh, we're now stuck. As a public company, I can only tell you what's public knowledge. So <laughs> welcome to the world of public companies. So we uh, uh, will finish the year with more than 170 million, which is enough to finance us into 2016 and into uh, multiple clinical trials on our two lead programs. Um, uh, we anticipate um, getting starting and having data over the next couple of years in um, a trial in non-Hodgkin lymphoma patients that have a particular genetic mutation. Uh, we just presented data earlier this summer in a, a couple of patients who are actually seeing responses even at very low doses, which is pretty exciting for us. Uh, a, a study in a childhood tumor called malignant rhabdoid tumor for which current treatment for these kids um, who are typically around two years of age when they get this cancer. Current treatment is high-dose chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery if they survive the chemo and radiation. So we're going to be starting a trial in those, those kids for which there is nothing that can be done. Um, and then we're going to start three, we either have ongoing or we'll start three leukemia trials over the next year. And so we have enough money to uh, initiate and fund those trials and we'll see where we end up after that. Dr. Gould, uh, without revealing anything specific that you can't say, at some point, uh, what's in the pipeline right now needs to be uh, commercializable, as it were. And that's a process of figuring out and convincing people that this is going to produce a revenue stream someplace in the, in the future. Yeah. You've got competition. Uh, once this thing hits, um, how do you know someone else is not going to do something similar or better at the same time? Uh, how do you convince your investors that, that this thing is actually going to pay off sometime? So that's a great question. So we actually face competition um, from sort of two different directions. Uh, one direction is the, is the disease that we are treating. Uh, so we're taking a particular, and I'll just use um, um, use either one. I'll, I'll use uh, the, I'll use the leukemia uh, drug as an example. So we have a particular approach in this leukemia uh, that we're treating, in which uh, uh, we'll treat about 10% of leukemia, acute leukemia patients um, have this particular genetic mutation, and that's what we're targeting. The competition we face from the disease are agents that might be broadly useful across any acute leukemia that are also in clinical trials. And in some ways, it's a, it's a race of two kinds. It's a foot race of, um, of who gets their drug approved first. Approving, approval is the because we're such a highly regulated industry, approval is, is critical for us. Um, and and uh, getting approval first is, is critical. And, a, and a, a race of um, effectiveness. Who's got the mo most effective drug in treating this form of acute leukemia? So we, we track uh, progress on both of those um, in, in a number of ways. Um, we subscribe to uh, uh, databases that, that tell us who's where our competitors are. Uh, because it's a regulated environment, we can assess where they stand by their regulatory filings under, under freedom of information. All of our trials have to be done in uh, medical centers and hospitals, and so we can assess where they may be by um, what hospitals they're associated with. And if a physician says, no, I can't work with you because I'm working with Acme Pharma, um, that tells us a lot. So it's like, um, in many ways, it's, it's like tracking your competition and being sure that you are, uh, back to one of the keys, you are so paranoid about where they are and where you are that you constantly believe that you're behind them and you're running as hard as you can. I ran track and cross country when, we were, when I was at Spring Harbor. And um, one of the, the ways, the things we always used to tell ourselves is that um, uh, the, the other schools that we'd run against, particularly at that time, I don't know if they're still run against them, or Aquinas and Calvin, or sort of the Western half, we'd always tell ourselves they're training harder than we are. They're running two more miles than we are. They're lifting more weights than we are. Um, and that's still the kind of paranoia you need in business is that the competitors are ahead of you and they're going to beat you. Um, so that's probably the major way 
that we track our competitors. The way we uh, maintain our investor interest is uh, lots of contact and lots of information on what our plans are, what our progress is. If, they, if we're not going to hit milestones and deadlines, we tell them that we're not going to hit it. So they, they have uh, a full understanding of where we're headed. And, and um, in that regard, it's all about managing expectations. In the biotech world, people are betting on you uh, for your future revenue stream, not your current revenue stream. And that means you need to manage their expectations on where you are and where that revenue stream is coming from. Um, this week's a good example. I spent uh, Wednesday, uh, Tuesday at late afternoon, I flew from down, we're, our company's in Boston. I flew from Boston down to New York, which is a short flight, like a 40 minute flight. I had dinner with uh, four investors. Um, I then, uh, the next day, in groups of three or four, met with probably another 40 or 50 investors. So I, I had about 10 meetings with three or four investors, and each one of those meetings um, started at 8, got done about 6 30. Um, you know, um, you know that's a, I'll do that maybe once every two weeks or three weeks um, this time of year, just to manage expectations and maintain communication. It's the most important thing is telling them where you are, telling them where you're going, and telling them what you uh, expect to do, and then doing it. How many of the employees do you have right now? We are at 84 today, so uh, we started the company with well, the day the Series H closed in March of 2008, we actually had three employees that were all signed up and ready to go as soon as the, the money ended up in the bank. Uh, we're at 84 uh, today. Um, if you look over our forecast, we'll be growing at about the same rate over the next couple of years. We've chosen a model in which we do a lot of outsourcing of our activities to contract research organizations. So we actually have contracts with um, Companies in Canada, United States, UK, France, India, China, um, Russia. I think that's all the geographies. Um, and so we outsource a lot of our activities. Not not because you know outsourcing sometimes, particularly with sort of China and India, is, is viewed as you're doing it in order to get something done cheaper or. And that's not why we do it. We do it for two reasons. Uh, one is um, to manage our growth and our headcount. Uh, internal headcount is expensive, are expensive heads. They're particularly expensive in a high rent area like Boston, in which you know, our, our, uh, our what's called a triple net square footage rent is, is really, really high. And so every space that we can get a headcount someplace else is, is money we're saving in, internally. Um, and that's why we outsource to the UK or North Carolina or Montreal, because the, the, the rent is just cheaper, the headcount cost is just cheaper. Um, so there's a cost component to that. The other, the other reason we outsource is because we can then select experts in every area that we need without having to look for them, hire them, incur those um, maintenance costs. I went, when I was at Mark, I went through a couple of cycles of downsizing, which is what you know, we euphemistically call firing people when you when you can't pay them anymore and need to cut budget. Um, I really don't want to go through downsizing again. It's awful on everybody. And by managing through CROs, we can manage our head, head count uh, efficiently. In the interest of time, I'm going to ask the questions on behalf of the students about that. Do you think Terms from the, the business school, I know that you've been talking to the, the science majors too, but well, that as a young company, um, you have scientists on board, but you also have business people that support them yeah. within the functions. So we, we actually do. We take about uh, one or two science interns a summer, and usually one business intern a summer. And in our business group, it falls into a business development group, which is sort of strategy and planning, and then the finance group, which is what it sounds like. People want to be CPAs, accounts receivable. We do that for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, sort of pay forward, if you will. The other, the other reason is um, it gives people a chance to take vacation so we can get in and to be sure that bills are getting paid and the spreadsheets are getting done and, and they learn something, we get an advantage and, and we pay forward. So. Any of the final question, dying question that you want to ask? <laughs> 
I would now have a lesson. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gold, for his time and for his insight.